This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. I'm Waldo Martin, professor of history here at Cal and a member of the Jefferson Memorial Lectures Committee. We're pleased, along with the Graduate Council, to present, to present Professor Nell Irvin Painter, this year's speaker in the Jefferson Memorial Lecture Series. The Jefferson Memorial Lecture Series was established in 1944 through a bequest from Elizabeth Bonestell and her husband, Cutler L. Bonestell. A prominent San Francisco couple, the Bonestells cared deeply for history and had hoped that the lectures would encourage students, faculty, scholars, and those in the community to study the legacy of Thomas Jefferson and to explore values inherent in American democracy. Past lecturers, Ambassador Jean Kirkpatrick, Senator Alan Simpson, this is a text, um, Representative Thomas Foley, uh, Walter Lefebvre, Archibald Cox, have delivered Jefferson Memorial Lectures on early American history about Jefferson himself, and on American institutions and policies in politics, economics, education, and law. Personally, I am honored and humbled to introduce Professor Painter, Edwards Professor Emerita of Princeton University. Professor Painter is one of the most important and influential historians of our time. Her list of distinguished publications, academic and scholarly awards, and honorary degrees dazzles. As a scholar and public intellectual, Professor Painter has helped transform how we think and write about 19th and 20th century US history. Her wide-ranging and stimulating body of historical scholarship has ranged across African-American history, Southern history, working class history, women's history, cultural history, social history, and for good measure, intellectual history. Her scholarly range is stunning. Her scholarship itself is exemplary. Because of her powerful work, we now see 19th century black immigrants, black working class radicals and communists, the late 19th and early 20th century, Sojourner Truth, enslaved women, and yes, white people in fresh and revealing ways. Those of us who make it a point to read her work, including her strikingly perceptive essays, articles, and reviews, delight in her historical sensibility, her erudition, her rigor, her insight, and her inviting prose. Those of us who know Nell personally marvel at the commitment to teaching and to the training of future historians and scholars both of these have earmarked her path-breaking career, a career that took her to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and the University of Pennsylvania before Princeton. 
Many of her former graduate students have gone on to illustrious, illustrious scholarly careers in their own right. Nell's mentorship is not only exceptional, but legendary. A genuinely cool and deeply humane person, Nell has modeled intellectual generosity, graciousness, and rigor. At critical points in the careers of many historians, like myself, Nell has provided not only verbal encouragement and sage advice, but she has also provided substantive and helpful criticism, necessary criticism. For that, her mentorship, and the in inspiring example of her work and her career, we are all indebted. Nell Irvin Painter, as they say where I come from, a proud and brilliant black woman pointed the way. Today, having retired from her Princeton gig, Nell Irvin Painter is reinventing herself becoming an exciting visual artist, sporting a 2009 BFA from Rutgers and a 2011 uh, MFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. With her BA in anthropology from Berkeley, her MA in Afri African history from US UCLA, and her PhD in American history from Harvard, she knows a thing or two about credentials. Not bad as my down-home friends would say, for a true home girl, a graduate from Oakland Tech's gifted and talented program. This afternoon, Professor Painter will be speaking on and illustrating why white people are called Caucasian. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Melvin. That was terrific. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Well, thank you so much, Waldo. It is really lovely. It's wonderful to be back in the Bay Area. I haven't been here since last year. My father, who's now 94, who spent his career in Lewis Hall as the chief technician of chemistry, last year came uh, to New Jersey. So we haven't been coming back as often as we did before. Uh, I wanna thank the uh, Jefferson Lecture Committee for bringing me here from Newark and for giving me the chance to talk to you and see old friends and some new friends. So this afternoon, my talk has three sections. One is an autobiographical section, fairly short. I want to tell you something about my process. Uh, the second part is the actual body of the lecture with the illustrations which I made especially for you. And then the last section is very brief. It has just one image which the Georgian uh, National Museum very kindly let me use without making me pay for permission. So the question of why are white people called Caucasian lies at the foundation of my, 19, in my 2010 book, The History of White People. People ask me, why did you write that book? And I said, I wanted to understand why white people are called Caucasian. I started working during the Chechnyan wars of the uh, late 20th century, and I thought, why are white people called, why are American white people called Chechens? And so the book came out of that. So um, the book took many hundreds of pages. It's a very visual book, because I wrote it while I was in art school. Uh, but it's fundamentally a history book rooted in an archive of words. Its research came out of the Princeton University Library. And I actually dedicated the book to the Princeton University Library. In the book, Jan Friedrich Blumenbach, 1752 to 1840, uh, who plays a central role in the question I'm asking, uh, also has nearly an entire chapter. But his role in my presentation to you this evening, uh, he is really somewhat smaller 
And that has to do with the process, my process of putting together this talk. So as Professor Martin told you, I spent five years in art school at Rutgers and at the Rhode Island School of Design. And there I learned to see, to really, really see. And the process of making an image, whether you make it with your hand, which I do, or you make it with your computer, which I also do, and the images that I'm going to show you this afternoon are digital images that I made in my computer. But whether you do it one way or the other, manually or digitally, you have to fill the space. That means seeing into all that space. And that process profoundly altered what I could see in the, what I had written, actually, and what I had already studied to write a book. So, for instance, the skulls now occupy a much more important place than before because I looked at them and I looked for them with an artist's eye, not simply looking for words. So the artifacts that, reduced, uh, that reached science, I now see as particular artifacts belonging to particular people and that reached to science through the hands of particular people. So my image center approach has the great advantage of embodying, not just quoting or analyzing, scientific utterance, embodying scientific utterance. Because usually in historical writing, the people who intone scientific truth, they remain relatively unknown. Usually you can't see them, you can't see what they're wearing, you can't see how they stand, you can't see their jewelry, for instance. Um, but in today's lecture, written and produced by an artist as well as a historian, I hope to make you see as many people in this story as possible into real people in actual places and particular circumstances. Even those whose destiny was to appear as parts of a taxonomy, as type de ceci, type de ceci, cela, as types of millions of people, really, they turn out to be particular individuals whose intimate experiences place them in the path of science. So that's my autobiographical introduction telling you about my process and how my process influenced what I'm going to show you today. So my topic, the question, why are white people called Caucasian, it's a pretty simple question and it's crossed a lot of people's minds. It's crossed more people's minds than have actually said it. How many of you have wondered about that? Put your hand up if you... Oh, okay. How many of you have said it out loud, have actually said to somebody, why are white people called Caucasian? Oh, so many fewer. So this has come up pretty often um, this year. So here's a general question, why are white people called Caucasian? And here's the question for 2013. Now, where exactly is the Caucasus, or is it are the Caucasus? Look for the red Google marker between the Black and the Caspian Seas. That shows you the place we're looking for, or the places we're looking for. And they're right on the border between Europe and Asia. Now, anthropologists have known what Caucasians look like in terms of taxonomy, type de Caucasus, or something like that. And this one, these images come from William Z. Ripley's Races of Europe, 1899, which was the Bible of race thinking uh, in the early 20th century, was the Bible for the federal government in the era 
of closing down immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe. So those people standing behind my Brooklyn revelers, those people are or were Caucasians. Now, a word on naming. In both the popular literature and the scientific literature, the names of the people and the places slide around. So we talk about Caucasian, we talk about Circassian or Circassian, we talk about Georgian, and those terms function almost uh, interchangeably uh, outside of Russia. But in the historical period, that is before the 20th century, before the late 20th century, those people were synonyms of the most beautiful people in the world. And if you ask Georgians, that is from the Republic of Georgia, if you ask them now, is it true Georgians are the most beautiful people in the world? What do they say? Yes. Uh, I haven't met Circassians and I haven't met people from the Caucasus who call them Cauca themselves Caucasian, so I don't know their answer. Within Russia, however, Caucasians are the subject of negative stereotype, as a young American living in Moscow explains in this snippet of a video. Um, well, basically, what I want to talk about is um, what is the deal with the Caucasians in Moscow? And I'm not like a racist person or anything, especially because I'm black. Like, how am I going to be racist in Russia <laughs> about other people? But it's not even that. I mean, like, all right, let me explain. There's always a huge group of them. And it's like, they don't socialize with the Russians there. It's, it's hard to explain. Like, I have a great Caucasian friend from, um, he lives in Russia. Sorry, I forgot what countries he's from. He's from, and he's probably watching this video right now. But yo, it's early in the morning. I was drinking last night. I'm sure George understands. But I have a great friend named George. You know, he's Caucasian. And he doesn't even like the average Caucasian in Russia. Now, from what I hear from people, is that they're dangerous. They carry knives. They carry guns and all this stuff. And um, maybe that is, maybe that isn't. But I just want to know the deal. Because apparently, from what I hear from a number of Russian people, that Caucasians are disliked more than blacks in Russia, like African black. And I'm like, holy crap, you know, they're hated more than us? I didn't think that was possible. <laughs> the view from Moscow. Now, uh, in February 2014, the Winter Olympics will begin in Sochi, which is the Black Sea Resort in the Western Caucasus. And you are going to be hearing more about Sochi this afternoon and also in February. Meanwhile, back in the United States, scientific literature freely employs the word Caucasian as a term taken for granted to mean white people or non-black people or non-people of color. So it's a word that's still circulating and it still circulates because it still circulates. It has a place in American jurisprudence. For instance, Judge Anthony Kennedy's opinion for the Supreme Court of the United States in Fisher versus University of Texas at Austin in June of this year, Kennedy mentioned, without pausing, to the petitioner, that is Abigail Noel Fisher, who is Caucasian. Kennedy's statement prompted a New York Times reporter to ask, has Caucasian lost its meaning? And this article was on the 6th of June, 6th of July, 2013. I'm actually quoted in it. And the reporter, uh, Shayla Dewan, notes in her piece, this is her quote, in 1889, the editors of the Oxford English Dictionary noted that the term Caucasian had been practically discarded, 1889. She continues, but they spoke too soon. Blumenbach's authority had given the word a pseudo-scientific sheen that preserved its appeal. Even now, 
the word gives discussions of race a weird technocratic gravitas, as when the police insist that you step out of your vehicle instead of your car. There is a short answer to my question, short but opaque. In the late 18th century, Jan Friedrich Blumenbach, an 18th century German scholar, assigned the name to people living in Western Europe, to the River Ob in Russia, to Northern Africa, and to India, call them Caucasian. It's a large group of people. Blumenbach enjoyed a scholarly reputation that gave his designation enormous heft, and it got picked up very quickly. Although the term Caucasian now has many synonyms, including white, it, return, it retains a certain currency by dint of repetition. So the short answer is that skull, you see. The fuller and longer answer is complicated and it entails the history of scholarly exchange, Russian imperialism, and notions of human beauty. So the short answer first. Jan Friedrich Blumenbach, the father of physical anthropology, the father of scientific anthropology, called the people in Europe over to India, well into Russia uh, and North Africa, Caucasians, because they were the most beautiful in the world. And here you have Blumenbach and the skull that inspired the designation. And Blumenbach says, also for the determination of the really most beautiful form of skull, which in my beautiful typical head of a young Georgian female, always of itself attracts every eye however little observant. So the author of Di Gadaris Humanae Veritate Nativa, written in Latin, Blumenbach had 82 skulls, and this made him an expert in human taxonomy. He made a five-fold a designation, a taxonomy of human types. He called them varieties. And he arranged them from left to right. Now, this is not a hierarchical arrangement. Some of you may know Stephen Jay Gould's book, The Mismeasure of Man. Do you know that book? Yeah. So uh, Gould shows a triangle with the Caucasian skull at the top. That's not the way Blumenbach laid it out. Blumenbach was a believer in the unity of mankind. He was a black bibliophile in the sense that he collected books by black authors. He really believed in the unity of mankind. So he arranged the skulls according to uh, difference. So at the two ends were the Mongolian and the African. And he thought of them as the extremes. In the middle, is the beautiful one. It's the gorgeous median. And that's the Caucasian. And then the, the ones beside the Caucasian uh, are the American and the Malay, because he thought those were the intermediate races. So in short, uh, Blumenbach's most beautiful skull, the one in the middle, gave this large group of people, which we can call white people, but it includes many others, the name Caucasian. Now, a fuller answer. We need to look at Russian imperialism and English imperialism, scholarly networks, and slavery. Slavery, which gave rise to the figure of the Odalisque, that is, the beautiful white slave girl, as a figure of quintessential beauty. So this is about beauty not only of skulls, but also of slave girls. But whose skulls were these? And how did they get to Blumenbach in Germany? 
The skull that made white people Caucasian was a gift of Georg von Asch, 1729 to 1807, a Russian of German background who had studied at Blumenbach's Göttingen University. And Asch was considered one of the great fathers of the Göttingen Library and all their collections. So one of the five skulls embodying Blumenbach's human varieties, I'm sorry, of those five skulls, two of them came from Asch. Asch also sent skulls and books and all sorts of things. So here we have Asch giving the skull to Göttingen. Now, Asch gave lots of skulls to Blumenbach. Of the 82, something like 20 or 25 came from Asch. Who was this man? He had some nice clothes. That's one thing we know. He was a medical doctor who served in Catherine the Great's armies when Catherine the Great was launched on imperialism uh, at the expense of the Ottoman Empire and others as well. She was a Russian of German background, as many of the aristocratic Russians were, and Ash served her imperial designs. In the 1780s and 1790s, Catherine was taking over the Caucasus. Uh, she began with Georgia as a protectorate of Russia in 1783. And remember, the beautiful skull was from Georgia. The Russian conquest of the Caucasus took a century and entailed ethnic cleansing and genocide. And to this day, every time Russian power falters, Caucasians make a break for independence. So, Two of Blumenbach's five skulls from Ash. Two of Blumenbach's five skulls came from a wealthy and influential, ultimately knighted English naturalist named Joseph Banks, 1743 to 1820. Banks had taken part in Captain Cook's first voyage uh, to the South Seas in the 1760s, early 70s. And actually, for California, you know, you probably all think that eucalyptus are native to California, right? Where do they come from? And who brought them there? Banks. I mean, he didn't bring them here. But Banks was one of those people who saw things that would be useful in one place and said, why don't you take them somewhere else? So we can thank Banks for eucalyptus and uh, uh, acacia. Um, he, he, was a, he was a very wealthy young man. And uh, as a young man, he corresponded with Linnaeus, uh, the father of taxonomy. And he actually employed one of Linnaeus's students as his sort of personal little Linnaeus. Um, so he headed the Royal Society for many years. And he sent Blumenbach uh, the skulls that Blumenbach labeled American and Malay. The Malay one was from uh, Tahiti. And Banks sent uh, his men in, in the bounty over to Tahiti to dig up breadfruit. He said breadfruit would be a very useful thing to have in St. Vincent in the Caribbean good thing to eat, cheap. So he sent his men out to dig up the breadfruit. They spent months and months and months doing that. And during that time, they uh, made liaisons with um, local women. And one of the reasons for the mutiny on the bounty was having to leave Tahiti to go to St. Vincent with the breadfruit. So Banks was also a connoisseur of skulls. And he sent the American skull and the Malay skull. So that's, um, now we've accounted for four of the five skulls. 
The fifth skull, which was labeled Ethiopian, came from a professor at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, and I have not been able to identify him beyond the name that Blumenbach gave and spelled it Stef Joel van Guns. Can't find him. But we know that the skull is female and that he called it Ethiopian. Blumenbach did not provide the names of four of his five skulls. He called them typical skulls. But he kept careful records, careful enough that the individuals begin to emerge if we look more closely and bring together the images and the words. So the Mongolian skull is the only skull with a name. It's called um, Mongolian, uh, Blumenbach calls it Mongolian, but we know that, that the owner of it lived in Siberia. This is one of Asha's skulls. The Ethiopian, we know, was the common law wife of uh, a man who brought her from West Africa, from Africa to the Netherlands, and considering the, uh, the traffic, probably she was from Ghana, what we now call Ghana, and we know that she died in Amsterdam in her 28th year. The American lived in the Caribbean island of St. Vincent, and this is the St. Vincent where Banks had close friends, including the head of the Royal Garden. So uh, we know that the Carib chief's bones were dug up for Banks and then sent to Blumenbach. And then the skull labeled Malay belonged to a Tahitian, most likely one of the wives or girlfriends of the sailors whom Banks had sent to dig up breadfruit trees. The one in the middle, the Caucasian, a Georgian woman, very young by the look of her teeth. Do any of you know what used to happen to women when they became pregnant? What happened to their teeth? Lots of cavities and fewer teeth. So before the age of fluoride and good dentist, when women got pregnant, they very often lost their teeth. This woman has all her teeth. This is a very young woman whose fate was exceedingly unhappy. A young Georgian female, after her venereal sudden death, sent to the Theatrum Atonomicum for legal abduction. That is to say, after she died of venereal disease, a scientist boiled her down and sent her skull to Asch, and Asch sent it to Gerningen, to Blumenbach. The Georgian's death through sex and Blumenbach's linking of Caucasians with beauty belongs to a longer tradition. I don't know when the tradition started. I know it goes back to the 17th century in Western Europe. I suspect it may be of Ottoman or Iranian um, beginnings. Now remember Blumenbach's hymn to the beauty of his Georgian skull? Really the most beautiful form of skull in which my beautiful typical head of a young Georgian female? In this regard, Blumenbach joined a tradition dating back to the 17th century that called Caucasians, Circassians, uh, or Georgians the most beautiful people in the world. And this, at least in that part of the world, is a tradition that lives on.
Nice looking people, huh? And young. One of the earliest Europeans to attempt to categorize people by body type was François Bernier, uh, 1625 to 1688, a French physician and traveler who became the personal physician of the Mughal emperor of India for 12 years. In the image that I've made for you, Bernier sits, sits down below there by the bush under his more illustrious compatriot, Jean Chardin. Bernier's 1684 publication, Nouvelle Division de la Terre par les différentes espèces de races qui l'habitent, is considered the first post classical classification of humans into distinct races. In Nouvelle Division de la Terre, he had referred to the beauty of Circassian women as assumed by all the travelers, all the travelers. In a 1667 letter from Shiraz, Persia, Bernier described the burning of widows in India. At this point in his career, he was evidently going around watching widows being burnt because he described several of the burnings, older ones, younger ones, and so forth. And at one burning, he was together with Jean Chardin, who was another illustrious French traveler who was also a jewelry merchant. It was Chardin's description of beautiful Georgians that Blumenbach quoted in his book as proof that Circassian beauty or Georgian beauty was agreed upon by scientists. Uh, Chardin's Journal du Voyage de Chevalier Chardin en Perse et aux Indes Orientales par la Mer Noire en Cushide, uh, 1689. This book is the authority that Blumenbach refers to when he speaks about Georgian beauty. For Chardin, the blood of Georgia is the most beautiful in the Orient and I would have to say, in the world. For I have never noticed an ugly face of either sex in this country, and some are downright angelic. Nature has endowed most of the women with graces not to be seen in any other place. I have to say it is impossible to look at them without falling in love with them. And this is a quote from Chardin, and Chardin is together with contemporary Georgians, that is, Georgians of our time, uh, and also the most famous Georgian of the 20th century, Joseph Stalin. Now, by the time Blumenbach wrote in the late 18th century, Chardin's view was commonplace. And the world's most illustrious philosopher, Immanuel Kant, agrees with Chardin and with Blumenbach. In Observations on the Feeling of the Beautiful and the Sublime of 1763, Kant says, Circassian and Georgian maidens have always been considered extremely pretty by all Europeans who travel through their lands. And Kant goes on to repeat something that appears over and over and over again in this literature, that the Caucasians, the Georgians, the Circassians sell their children, particularly their girls, to the Turks and to the Arabs and the Persians because, for, for reasons of what we would call eugenics, that, that is to beautify the race. And then Kant and all the others slime the Turks by saying they really need it. <laughs> exactly. Now, uh, much better known in the English-speaking world was uh, a traveler and Cambridge professor named Edward Daniel Clark, 1769 to 1822. Clark uh, wrote Travels in Various Countries of Europe, Asia, and Africa, first published in 1810, but republished and revised and republished and revised 
republished in the United States as well. So Clark was a much better known authority in the United States on this issue than Kant or Chardin or Bernier. And for Clark, uh, again, uh, as an eyewitness, he also testified that the women of the Caucasus are the most beautiful in the world. Uh, he was a tutor in Jesus College in Cambridge University, a member of the Academy of Sciences in Berlin, in the Cambridge Philosophical Society, and many other uh, learned societies that formed an important scholarly network. So in Clark's work, the notion of uh, Circassian beauty or Georgian beauty is taken uh, for granted. Now, what is this lady? This is 1850s, a Circassian beauty in the United States. This is Barnum's American Museum. And in the 1850s and 60s, Barnum showed uh, several women, all with afros, as Circassian beauties, the most beautiful women in the world, and for American audiences, examples of white purity. Now, why the headdress? Or why the hair? I mean, we know why the hair. She had hair like this and she let it grow. But why was this associated with Circassians? This is the headdress of Circassian warriors. So the woman in New York her hair echoes the headdress. Now, over and over again, in the authorities I've mentioned to you, the idea of the beauty of Caucasians is linked with the idea of the slavery of Caucasians. So before the Atlantic slave trade uh, to the Western Hemisphere, shaped our ideas about what slave trades are all about. There was a slave trade from this part of the world, that is uh, the Caucasus, Ukraine, Crimea, and so forth. And that trade goes back before the reaches of time. This is Herodotus. Herodotus writing in the fifth century BC um, writing about the enumeration of taxes and tributes paid to the Persian kingdom, uh, collected from the lands that it controlled and the lands even far away in the distance. He said that a voluntary contribution was taken by the Colchians, that is the Georgians, and the neighboring tribes between them and the Caucasus and it consisted of, and still consists of, that is in the fifth century BC, every fourth year, a hundred boys and a hundred girls. This was before Herodotus could even see the beginnings of it. I should add, uh, Herodotus also mentioned a tribute from the southernmost part of the edges of the Persian world, and that was for people called Ethiopians. And what they owed was gold and ivory. People were not mentioned. So the Black Sea slave trade was the slave trade in the Western world until the 15th century when the Ottomans captured Constantinople and cut the Black Sea off from Western Europe. At that point, 15th century, the Atlantic slave trade becomes the Western slave trade. So let's go back to Jean Chardin for a moment. His famous words of 1689 actually describe a familiar experience in the Black Sea in the 1660s. This was Chardin who was in the, um, in the cameo there. 
Chardin was actually on a voyage to India to buy jewelry, but he couldn't go his usual way, the southern way. So he went through the Caucasus, which he hated. He hated it. But uh, in the Black Sea area, he describes a situation where he was on a boat with captives, with slaves. And he talks about one particular woman who was 25 with a smooth, even, lily-white complexion and admirably beautiful features. I have never before seen such beautifully rounded breasts. That beautiful woman inspired overall sensations of desire and compassion. Now, it turned out that on that voyage and on that boat was a Greek trader, and Greeks handled that long-standing Black Sea uh, slave trade. So Chardin tells us what people cost. He says in crowns, I have translated it into pounds, so you can get a, a sense of what we're talking about. Pretty girls age 13 to 18, went for about 60 pounds. Plainer girls for less. Women went for about 36 pounds. Children from 9 to 12 pounds. Men aged 45, uh, 25 to 40 for about 45 pounds. Those older only about 24 pounds to 30 pounds. The Greek merchant whose room was next to Chardin's on the boat bought that beautiful woman with the baby at her breast for about 36 pounds. Daniel Edward Clark, our Cambridge Don, also located Circassian beauty or Caucasian beauty in the enslaved. The Circassians frequently sell their children to strangers, particularly to Persians and Turkish seraglios. The most beautiful prisoners of both sexes go there. He speaks of one particular Circassian female who was 14, who was conscious of her great beauty, who feared her parents would sell her according to the custom of the country. How much? The women selling generally from 25 to 30 rubles apiece, somewhat less than the price of a horse. The beautiful young slave girl became a figure, and she had a name, Odalisque. She combines the powerful notions of beauty, sex, and slavery. In American and uh, European art, in the 19th century particularly, she looks like the white girl next door, but she is a slave, so you can do with her as you will. Ingres, Jerome, Powers, and Matisse specialized in odalisque paintings. The figure of the Odalisque faded from memory as the Black Sea slave trade ended in the late 19th century, and the Atlantic slave trade overshadowed that from the Black Sea. Today, the word slavery invariably leads to people of African descent. Americans seldom associate the word Odalisque with slavery in the Americas, and parenthetically, um, Today, many American uh, painters use odalisque figures. Um, Micheline Thomas, for instance, has done a series of what she calls American odalisque. But the phrase and the figure of the odalisque has lost its association with slavery. And now, in American art history and uh, in contemporary American art, Odalie simply refers to a beautiful woman, usually unclothed. Now, um, in North and South American history, the Odalisque like figure appears in the guise of the beautiful quadroon. Uh, in Uncle Tom's Cabin, for instance, Eliza 
and her son um, in Harriet Beecher Stowe's work. The Caucasus and Russian imperialism. Although the Odalis Association of Caucasian Beauty and White Slavery has slipped out of memory, the Caucasus continues as a region in revolt against Russian control. Caucasians have not forgotten the ethnic cleansing they suffered in their 100 years uh, war against uh, Russians, which cost at least half a million Caucasian lives. And you will see part of this in part of a recent video which mentions the slaughter of Caucasians in a place called Sochi. <laughs> Сиянам инагур ипсалыхар. Сшогшанкам кахуа кашахар. Сиянам кижихт си арбеду игт. Нужаят диауж иту кагуау хад дзакканам хадау варсидзам гузавагуам дихадзат. Сиянар нахыбау Заплачерт, Юпача, Сенахра, Бауа Бабшау, Гузавау, Сари, Сишинат. Whenever Russian power has seemed threatened, the Caucasian borderland has pulled away. After the Second World War, Joseph Stalin exiled millions of Circassians to Dagestan and Kazakhstan places that came up in the story of the Boston bombers last spring. As the Soviet Union broke apart, Chechnya struck out for independence, and more recently, in 2008, Georgia and Russia played a part in U.S. policy discussions. In conclusion, Caucasian is only one term for people of European descent. The word used depends on the context and the group taken as its opposite, who is speaking, to whom, when, where, and for what purpose. The use value of Caucasian depends on its use, not on any basis in biological fact. The term Caucasian for white people grows from three main roots. One root lies in the history of imperialism, especially the Russian campaigns of Catherine the Great and her army, and the German-trained medical doctor, Georg von Asch, who sent so many specimens to Blumenbach. British imperialism also played its part in the person of Joseph Banks. One root lies in notions of beauty, Caucasians as the most beautiful people in the world. And one root lies in the idea and the ideal of enslaved women as especially beautiful, as in the Odalisque. Yes, the term Caucasian for people of European descent is not only outmoded, it has always been contingent. It didn't work in pre-Holocaust Europe, where divisions were drawn between G Gentiles and Jews, and Jews were racialized even though they were of European descent. It didn't work in societies like the Balkans, where religion divided people. So you can use it if you want, but understand that it's only as scientific as its use. When researchers start using Caucasian to mean white Americans, the term will no longer be recognized. Now, a coda. On Thursday, the 17th of October, 2013, the New York Times ran a front page story entitled, Skull Fossil Suggests Simpler Human Lineage, illustrated by Skull 5, another sensational Georgian skull. Dmanisi, Georgia, the skull was 1.8 million years old. 
This skull was found along with four others, a group find unusual in archaeology. Usually skulls are found alone, leading anthropologists to classify each different one as a different species. Each single skull usually became the embodiment of a different group of humans, as was in the case with Blumenbach's five skulls. Each of his individual skulls, the skulls of girlfriends or victims of sexual assault, became the figure for an entire classification of people. The group of skulls recently found in Georgia, however, is leading to a reverse conclusion. Even though skull five and each of the other skulls look different from one another, they're all taken to belong to the same group. The point of skull five's story is that ancient skulls, yes, differ from one another, not because they belong to different hominid species, as previously assumed, but because they belonged to different individuals. Even people who had been dead for more than a million years were individuals, not species. So here we come full circle from Blumenbach's 18th century skulls, notably his beautiful female skull from Georgia. Blumenbach's skulls had belonged to individuals, but he classified them as racial types. In October 2013, anthropologists finally realized that each individual is singular, that each skull's owner has its own life history. Thank you.